CSS has a pretty simple syntax, but there are a lot of fundamental principles in how it works that catch people off guard, which can lead to confusion and a lot of frustration. There's also times where there's multiple ways to do the same thing, and that can lead to extra frustration as well, because you don't know which one is better in any given situation. And CSS really is one of those things that when you first start off with it, it just seems like it's going to be the easiest thing in the world and quickly can lead to times where you just want to throw your computer out the window. So with that in mind, in this video, we're looking at six extremely important CSS concepts that when you understand them can really help simplify things and make your life much easier when you're writing CSS. Hi there, my front end friends, and welcome back to yet another video. I'm glad that you've come to join me once again. And if you're new here, my name is Kevin and here at my channel, I hope you fall madly deeply in love with CSS. And if I can't make you fall in love with it, I hope to at least help you be a little bit less frustrated with it. As I mentioned, we're going to be looking at six extremely important, maybe the most important uh, CSS concepts, but we're not just going to be talking about what they are, things like that. We're going to be looking at what they are and then how we can use them within actual code to simplify your life and take advantage of all of them so you can be writing CSS with a lot more confidence. Let's go and jump right into the first one that we have right here on the screen now. All right, so for this one, we're gonna be using this nice little simple uh, demo template that I have set up. There's a few styles obviously on here that aren't terribly important for what we wanna look at. So I've hidden them away so we can just focus on what I wanna look at. And the very first principle I do wanna explore is inheritance. And inheritance is one of those things you hear about early on, but then you forget about it or you don't really understand the implications of it. And so the very first thing is inheritance is when things are inherited between from like a parent into the children and grandchildren and all of that. So actually let's start in my HTML and look all the way at like the general structure where we have a body and then we have like a header here, we have a main, div, we have my h2 and all of that. And so when we're talking about inheritance, I mean here my h2 is a child of this div, which is a child of my main. And all of that goes down to the body here, which is the, the big parent. And of course, you know, everything is a child or grandchild or some sort of descendant of my HTML element that we have here, since that wraps our entire document. And everything that's visible on the screen is on our body. So usually when we want to take advantage of inheritance, we're either seeing the HTML selector or you're seeing the body selector. And for the most part, whichever one of these you choose is perfectly fine. Uh, there's a few things that are weird with height that I don't want to get into in this video. Um, so personally, I tend to just all put it on the body, but, but if you put some of these on the HTML, it's perfectly fine. And let's look at one of them now we're here. So I'm going to say color is let's do coral, uh, just so we see a big change and you can see all of it has changed. Now I haven't actually gone and selected my H2 or my paragraph here, but they have changed anyway. And the reason those have changed is because I changed the color on my body and color is one of the properties that's inherited by all of the descendants. Now there are exceptions to this with form elements where form elements don't actually inherit stuff. So you'll often see things like a button input text area and select and you'll see font inherit which actually forces these elements to now start inheriting all the font properties like you would expect them to in the first place. Um, and this is part of a reset that I usually use on my sites. And that can be one of those frustrating things too when form elements don't inherit things like you're expecting them to. And the reason we say font inherit is because that tends to be the default. Anything that's related to fonts, your typography, your font sizes, your colors, anything like that, your line height, uh, text alignment, all of those things are inherited. And in general, anything that is not related is not. So here I could do a text align center and everything becomes centered. And this is really, really useful when you're setting the stage for your site because it lets us write a lot less CSS. So you can set your color and I don't think we do that, but maybe you have a color of like 333, which is a dark gray. Uh, you have a font size here, which is maybe a 1.25 rem, just to boost up the font size a little bit. Um, heading font sizes are a little bit different. If you make these bigger, they don't inherit the exact size, but they'll grow in relation as a default. We can always overwrite things. Um, but setting up as many styles type relating to typography on the body as possible is always a good place to start. Or as I said, on the HTML uh, element, so when we're selecting those, just because then you set it once and then you don't have to worry about it again. And of course you can see here, I actually have different fonts coming through. So you can, like there's nothing stopping you from saying H2 font family of serif, just, you know, as a quick thing. And you can, you can change and get away from what's being inherited. Or I could come on my paragraphs and say that the color on my paragraphs is red. And you can overwrite these things with more specific selectors. 
But that's also the reason that inheritance is really, really useful. So as another quick example here, I've set up a div over here called dark background. And if I go, let's select that guy. So dot dark background. And he has a dark background. So, you know, background color of 333. Three, three. Why not? And we'll give that a color also of white so that we're setting everything up and it's all working. And I'm just going to throw a little bit of padding on there too. Uh, padding 1M just so we actually, you know, looks a little bit nicer. And the big advantage here is I'm only setting that on my dark background. I'm not selecting the heading that's inside of here and I'm not selecting my paragraph that's inside of here to overwrite it because I'm relying on inheritance. And in this case, it's these elements that are in here that are inheriting the background or not the background color, but the white text color from this, from this div that they're inside of. And if we didn't have inheritance, that could be really annoying. And it's also why we want to rely on inheritance because imagine here, instead of setting my color of 333 there, I actually set it on my paragraphs and I said this color should be my 333. Well, if I did that, then I lose my inheritance because I've gone very specific here and I've said my paragraphs are this, let's just call it black for simplicity, my paragraphs are black. So now the inheritance we get inside of here, I'm saying everything in here should have a color of white. But then when the browser is going through, it goes, okay, everything in here is white. The H3 is white. This paragraph, oh no, the paragraph will not inherit that color because I've set a color on it. So as much as possible, we want to rely on inheritance. And one way that we can switch colors, let's say we want our headings to be different colors. Because again, we could say H2 and H3 are color of purple, just so we have a color on them. That's terribly hard to read right here. And that means once again, we're not really relying on inheritance, but what we could do instead of this, and you can come here and say something like dot color accent is my color purple. And then you can just use that class wherever you want. So if I want this heading then to have it, we just come here and on my H2, I can give that a class of color accent. And that one changes without having any impact anywhere else. And then you get to pick and choose where things are a bit more. And if you do want to overwrite something, you can still overwrite it very easily. But taking advantage of your inheritance as much as possible means you get to write a lot less code. And then you can pick and choose places where you want to sort of break out of that. And I think that's one of the places where people go too much. They start selecting everything and trying to style everything individually. And it just creates so much more work for you. Now, the next thing is the cascade. You hear about the cascade again, just like inheritance, you often hear about this really early on. You sort of understand what it does, but you don't understand the implications necessarily of the cascade. And when I'm talking about the cascade, I'm right now mostly talking about we work top to bottom on something. And so when we're working top to bottom on something, it means the browser will read from the top to the bottom and apply the styles in that order. Now there's more, there's specificity that we'll talk about after, uh, but that comes into play and a few other things. But let's say I did my, um, we're gonna say my dark background here. I do that and then we get a bunch more code. You know, here there's more code, more code here. And then much lower down, you get another dark background that then sets the background to purple. And now my background's purple, even though here I'm setting it to be um, there and let's not use the shorthand. We'll just stick with the long version of both. And this is overriding this one because of the cascade, because we're working top and sort of flowing downwards through everything. And this is, I think, something that people understand early on. This isn't necessarily something you have to worry about working with too much. Um, but it, there is, there's a few different instances where things like this can catch you off guard because what you might have is something like your color accent here that's setting a color. And then you might have something else that's setting the color on it lower down and it's two different classes. It might not even be things that are overwriting each other, but it's two different classes that might be applied to the same thing that are in conflict and you can't figure out why yours isn't working. And so less, this one's less so about taking advantage of the cascade. It's just understanding that, you know, we go top to bottom, but it's how to find problems with the cascade because that's really annoying. And I, I've done this, I won't lie. I've had things like this too, where we're gonna make it really ugly here for a second, but where I'm here and I'm working on it, cause you might have, you know, you have 10 different properties and I'm like, white, why isn't it white? Uh, green, just to test and see if I'm, no, it's still not changing, what's happening? I've, I've been there <laughs> um, 
And then, so the easiest way to do it is in your dev tools, when you look here. And so anytime something's not working, it could be because a typo in your selectors. But if you come and you look, so here's my H3, I can find, and for that, I just right click and inspect, and it's gonna open the dev tools. This is in Firefox, but Chrome, Safari, they all have dev tools. They look more or less the same and work very similarly. So it's got my H3 here. And if I look in here, I can find the color. But it also shows me that I have a color white here that's being crossed off. <laughs> and it shows that it's coming from my dark background. And it tells me where in my CSS file it is. It's all happening on line 10. Uh, the other example is let's go to the dark background itself. So in my dev tools, I can just click on that. And that's where I can actually see here there's a background color. Uh, here's the background color that's working. And then here's the background color that's being crossed off. So when I look at that, I go, I have a purple background. Oh, that's on line 19. And I was working on this selector that's on line 10. And you can actually turn things on and off here and see, oh, if I didn't have that, then my background color would actually be working. Um, I'm not often using my dev tools to do that, but I look at it and go, oh, I completely forgot about that selector that I made lower down in my file because I wasn't being very well organized. And then this happened. Um, so the dev tools can be really useful to experiment with, but just to find these things, because you see the dev tools work in reverse. The styles that are winning are always at the top. And the more specific styles are at the top and you get to the more you get to inherited styles and you get to other things the lower down you go when you're in here so you'll often see things that are crossed out like over here all these things that are being crossed out let's not even worry about what most of these are uh, but that's the ones that are winning in your dev tools are always on the top which makes it easy to see why something is purple and you don't want it to be purple so then you can come in and sort of fix things up and that is one of the reasons why often you'll have more generic selectors first and then more specific styling of things a little bit later on. Uh, and you can just try and avoid these types of things where you accidentally have the same selector two times and then you end up with conflicts that you might not want to actually uh, have. And let's just switch this color back to white. So we have some text in there we can read. And the next thing I wanna talk about is the box model. And the box model is one of those things where it's just really important to do this in every file you ever work in, uh, which is your star and then over time, you're also gonna start using pseudo selectors, uh, especially if you follow any of my other videos. And when you, or these are actually pseudo elements. And when you start using pseudo elements, the star selector doesn't get everything. So the star means everything, just select everything, but it won't select your pseudo elements. If you don't know what they are yet, please don't worry about it, but just get in the habit of doing this because you're gonna need them eventually. Um, and on here, I'm just gonna say box sizing border box. And this won't really, actually impact things as much as it used to in the old days because in the old days we used to have to have widths on stuff all the time because we had float based layouts and widths and heights and stuff were much more prevalent than they are today these days a lot of the time we're using things like flex and grid to set up layouts and explicit widths and and things like that on actual elements are less common but there's still things that we do and the default behavior of elements is that when you set a width on something, like say I came on my background here and I say the width is 100 pixels. Uh, let's make that a bit bigger, 400 pixels. So it's 400 pixels wide and that's actually including the padding that I have on here. So my padding of 1M, let's just make that bigger. So it, you'll see that it's stopping here where my mouse is. And if I come and I change this to 3M, it's still stopping there. If I make this 5M, it's still stopping where my mouse is. So the padding is pushing inward and it's not actually making the element bigger, which means I know that my width is 400 pixels. And that's because of my box sizing border box. This is not the default behavior. That's why we need to write this in our CSS. And the default behavior here is actually called content box. And if I hit save on that, you're gonna see this get much wider. And the content box is just this width is the content itself. So like this, part here is 400 pixels. And then we're adding 5M on this side and we're adding 5M on that side. And so if I change the uh, if I change this down to one, I'm gonna put my mouse over here and hit save. And you can see the whole thing got smaller because it's doing the 400 plus this on top of it. It makes things much harder to calculate and to really be able to gauge and to know how big something will be. Uh, again, it's not as important as it used to be, but you're still gonna run into issues with it. So just a really quick one there for I won't dive into really what the box model is, which is your content, your padding, your borders, your margin. Uh, but just understanding this is one of those things that's really gonna save you a lot of trouble uh, in the long run. So I'd really recommend always starting off every file you do with that right at the top of your CSS.
And if you'd like a deeper explanation of the box model and how border box really does influence it and impact it, I do have done a longer video on it. So there should be a card popping up and there's a link in the description as well. Now, the next thing that I wanna talk about is specificity, which is a word that I've only recently been able to say. <laughs> and I'm glad that I can finally say it because it's a really important concept with CSS. Uh, and after doing five years of videos and talking about specificity, I'm glad that I finally figured out how to say it. And basically it's a little bit involved with the cascade and the order of things, but it's how specific our selectors are in our CSS. And there tends to be three levels of selectors that you hear mostly about. It's your element selectors. So no dot, no hashtag before you just write the element here. So just like I did before my paragraph, I'm selecting all my paragraph elements. These have a low specificity on them. The next one is my class selectors, which is starts with the dot. So here I'm choosing a class of color accent. And these are more specific than my paragraph here. Or I'm actually, let's just come here and do an H2 and say that the color here is red. And this is my H2 here and it hasn't changed. And even if I take this H2 and I move it down over here and I hit save on that, it's still not changing to red because this selector has more importance than my H2 here. So this is a higher specificity selector than my H2. And so even though the H2 here is lower down in the cascade, this is higher importance. So it wins and it takes over and the H2 can't, can't beat it um, other than using important, which I'm gonna recommend in general, you don't. I'm sure you've heard that one before. If you haven't, just try to avoid importance. Uh, I won't say they don't have their time in their place, but you get into trouble more often than not, especially early on in your journey. Uh, the next one is also your ID selectors. So you'll see an ID selector of, I'll just put example here. Um, and just like my color accent here is a higher specificity. So it's, it's more important, let's say, than my H2. This would beat it. So here, if I say this is the color of uh, lime green, this would always beat my color accent. So if we come over here and I do an ID on the H2 of uh, example, it now switches over to that lime green color. And once again, it doesn't matter where this is. Uh, an ID selector will always beat a class selector. And there's other ways of boosting it. If you have nested, if you have descendant selectors, um, if you have descendant selectors. So for example, my dark background H3, which is the lorem ipsum that's right there. And I said the color color is red. It will switch to red. But over here, if I just did H3 and I say color is blue, well, this is higher specificity than this one is right here. So this one is beating this because this is a class selector and a uh, element selector combined together. So just different ways that you can build up and actually increase specificity. And usually you'll see that you want to try and avoid too much nesting and things like that. Uh, a lot of design systems and a lot of different ways of writing CSS are going to involve single class selectors. I personally find having some descendant selectors is fine, even though it does boost the specificity of things. Uh, you just want to be very careful and very aware of what's happening. And once again, if you run into trouble with it, your dev tools can really help you out in seeing why something isn't working. So if I look here and I go on, let's go to this H2, I can see the red is crossed off, the color accent is crossed off, and I can see this one here is winning. And again, then it's just knowing that an ID will always beat a class, which will always beat an element selector. And once again, if you'd like a more in-depth tutorial, I have talked a lot more about specificity and have a video dedicated to it. So there should be a card popping up and there is a link in the description as well. Just one thing before we get to the next point is here I have like a color accent, a dark background um, example. <laughs> when you're coming up with your class naming, it can be really, really hard. And this isn't one of my points. This is just sort of a bonus that we're, we're I'm gonna throw at you. Uh, naming things in your CSS is very, very hard. As much as possible, I'd really recommend giving things meaningful names because I see a lot of people very early that will say like b1.b2, b3, or like box one, box two, box three and stuff. But then I guarantee you, you're gonna come, you're doing quick things, you're learning. Um, and so you never figure you'll come back to it and that's very possible, but it builds bad habits. I'd always try and give things meaningful names for what that thing is actually doing. Uh, and I would also avoid doing things like color purple just because the purple might change here to green later on and then the class doesn't make sense anymore. So meaningful names but that are a little bit more abstract um, can really help out instead of doing, you know, dark background. As long as it stays a dark background, it doesn't matter if this is 333 
or even if it has like a, a color to it, right? If we do like a three, three A, three B, one A, it's still going to be a pretty dark color. It's not black, but it's a dark color. So it's still a, a generic enough name, or you might even do inverse background. So you're switching or inverse colors. You're switching, you know, if dark theme, light theme, it becomes more applicable. Um, but anyway, don't overthink it, especially early on, but just try and stick with meaningful class names, uh, just cause it's going to make your life a lot easier in the long run. And don't build up the bad habits of just like random things every time to style something, uh, and take advantage to be able to reuse these. I have my dark background here and that means I can come in and then let's take that and we're just going to copy that and paste it here and paste it here. <laughs> and then I can have multiple things using that same class. So you don't need like a box one, box two, box three. Maybe all your boxes are the same. You can just throw a class at that one class at it and reuse it as much as possible. So just always think of class names as something that you, you might use only one time, but you might repeat and just try and stick with meaningful names as much as you can. Um, but moving on to the next thing. So I think this is tip number five, because that last one I'm not really counting, even though it's important, um, is talking about layouts. And in general, when you're building layouts, you're going to want to choose either to learn Flexbox or Grid. If you haven't learned either one of them yet, you will eventually want to learn both. And people wonder, you know, which one should I use and what, in what situation? And one thing you also come across is positioning and you can position things and move them where you want. I'm going to say, don't learn positioning early on. You do not need positioning. You're going to learn position absolute set a width, the height, put it where you want. That's like the worst possible way you could actually build a layout. Avoid positioning at all costs. It's something that's very useful. It's something that will come back. But early on in your journey, you probably don't need positioning. You probably just need Flexbox or Grid. And early on in your journey for making layouts, I'm going to say that Grid is the easier one to get started with. I recently did a getting started with Flexbox and a getting started with Grid videos. And the Grid one is just so much easier to get started with. It's, it can be more complex. There's a lot more to grid, but just to get started. And for most of the simple layouts you're going to need, I find grid a lot easier, especially for beginners. So with that in mind, what I'm going to do is here, uh, I'm just going to take my width off of this. And let's say I wanted this to be three columns. We can come here. And this is going back to when I talked about the box model. Um, widths these days, we don't need to set them as much because I'm going to let the parent do all the work here. And so what I'm going to do here, let's come in and do a div class is equal to, um, we'll just call it columns, nice and simple name. And we'll grab that columns that's right there. And so we have one dark background, two dark backgrounds, three dark backgrounds, and then I can close that div right here. You can see nothing really has changed yet. So let's go back over to here. And we'll come down and I'm going to say that columns class. So dot columns to select it and a display of grid and hit save and nothing happens. And this is one, if we were using flex, it would actually work in this case. But um, again, we're going to eventually you'd want to do something a little bit more complex, but not overly complex. And I still think grid is much easier to understand how it works uh, from the very beginning. And it gives you a lot more control on your layout um, overall. So display grid, and then we say grid template columns. And I want three columns, so I'm just going to do a 1FR, 1FR, 1FR. This is a unit that is only for grid, and this is why grid sometimes I think people shy away from it, is there's unique things to grid that you can't do anywhere else, but same with Flexbox, really. The FR is just like a fraction of the space. So one fraction for this column, one fraction for that one, one for that. It's flexible containers. We hit save, and we get three columns. And I'm just going to come here and put a gap of 1M or 1REM or five pixels or whatever you want and it puts a space between them. Now there's more to grid and there's obviously a lot more you can do with it. Guess what? <laughs> Just like a lot of these other things I have talked about it before. So if you want the simplest way to get started with grid card there, link in the description. And I've also put my link in the description to the easiest way to get started with Flexbox. But these days I really would recommend starting with grid to be able to build your bigger parts of your layout. And then once you're comfortable with the very basics of grid, you do not need to be a master of grid. Once you're comfortable with the basics of grid, then add Flexbox to your arsenal as well. If you'd want to go with Flexbox first, by all means, go for Flexbox first, but choose one or the other to start with. Don't need to master it. You can learn both at the same time, but I would get comfortable with one before adding the other one and don't use positioning for layouts. Positioning is for tweaks and other things that are going to come later on in your journey, not at the very beginning. And just before I move on to the next thing, you might also see some old tutorials with floats. I even have some here on YouTube with my own channel and there's lots of blogs and there's lots of tutorials out there where you might see floats coming up. 
If ever you have to maintain an old site, it could actually be useful to know how floats worked for layouts, but they're not a layout tool. They were a hack that we used for a while and that we luckily don't have to use anymore because we do have Flexbox and Grid. So if you see things that come up on building a layout with floats, for now completely avoid it. That could be something you learn much later on if ever you have the bad luck of having to maintain a project that does use them. But all modern layouts are built either with Flexbox or Grid. We shouldn't be using floats for layouts anymore. They have a purpose, it, not for creating layouts. I'm gonna say the last thing is a little bit based on what I just did here, which is as much as possible, try to create a separation between what, the way you're styling your layouts when it comes to the layout and the content itself. And what I mean by that is having a class like this where I'm setting up the, I'm setting my grid, I'm setting this, like this is making my layout. And I'm happy with that, it's working perfectly fine. And so that's what this is doing. Now if I wanted to change what's happening inside these cells, well that's where I'm gonna to go to this dark background class. I'm gonna come into what's happening here and I can modify this because these aren't affecting the layout of my site. These are just affecting the content that is inside that layout. And having these things, when you, when you try and do both of them at the same time, so I come on my columns and I come here and I start trying to do font size of say uh, two rem, and then I'm modifying that here. And then I'm maybe setting a color here of purple. But then of course this purple's not working because the dark background's overwriting it. And what's happening is this is doing two jobs now. This is both setting typography, setting content, trying to style my content and it's trying to style my layout. And this could work, and there's ways of doing it, and I've worked like this for a long time. But what happens is you run into these conflicts where you're trying to set something here, and this goes back to the cascade and the specificity and a lot of other things, where this isn't actually working and you're getting frustrated by it, not working. Um, now, you might have two things on the same div that are trying to accomplish this, but I would say for your classes that you're applying, trying to, this is these classes are controlling my layout and setting the stage for my layout. And then these guys here are more setting the stage for the styling of the content. And it just makes your life a lot easier because it's easier to find the selectors and easier to maintain smaller selectors that have more specific jobs. And even like, if you wanted to, we could even come in here and like, let's, let's remove this dark background from all of these guys. Uh, here's the third one there. And so then I could come on this columns class that's right here and I didn't save this file, so let's get rid of that purple. Um, but then in here I have columns and I could say my columns is a dark background. And it's applying both of them. It's setting the layout and it's styling that layout. But it's this is doing one job, this is doing another job. And that's basically, I think, makes your life a lot, more, a lot easier to deal with. Um, and it, you run into less conflicts and a lot less things like we were talking about a little bit earlier where you have more specific jobs for the different things that are going on. This is setting what the content inside of here looks like, and this is setting up the layout and how the layout is working, because it lets you separate those concerns a little bit. And it also helps those concepts a little bit of like, I'm gonna make this look the way I want it to, and then I can plug it into these different situations, and it's gonna work no matter where I'm plugging it into. And then for a lot of stuff, like I said, now we don't have to worry about widths and other things like that so much because these columns are just becoming columns that work in the space that they're given. And with that, I just wanna remind you that down below are the links to those videos that I did mention. So if you're waiting to the end, now is a good time to check those out. Or if you're a beginner in your journey and you'd like to see some important HTML concepts as well, including some that even experienced devs often get wrong, that video is right here for your viewing pleasure. And with that, I wanna give a really big thank you to Johnny, Adam, Stuart, Randy, and Tim for being my supporters of Awesome Over on Patreon as well as all my other patrons for their monthly support and of course until next time don't forget to make your corner on the internet just a little bit more awesome.